Thank you, Cheryl. Van, thank you. Making it so right in the way that we worship God, too. That was beautiful. Thank you. The student handbook at a Midwestern university includes a page on the difference between hearing and listening. Now, the, the, the page, well, let me just share with you an excerpt. Here's what it tells the college students. It says, hearing is simply the act of perceiving sound by the ear. If you're not hearing impaired, hearing simply happens. Listening, however, is something you consciously choose to do. Listening requires concentration so that your brain processes meaning from words and sentences. Listening leads to learning. Most people tend to be hard of listening <laughs> rather than hard of hearing. <laughs> At North Lake, we have a fair number who are hard of hearing. We do. We have, we have a fair number of folks here in our three services who uh, rely on hearing assistance devices, and it's important. And frankly, we are looking at ways to enhance our system in our worship spaces here and in the sanctuary that could even improve or optimize the function of hearing aids. There are ways to do that. We, we're, we're, we're investigating that, researching that, and, and perhaps can work that into our uh, 2018 plan and budget. It's something that we are looking to do. Because you see, you can help people who are hard of hearing. It's a lot harder to help persons who are hard of listening. That's much more difficult. So one of the reasons why I, I truly appreciate the call story, the narrative of Samuel, and Susan did a great job sharing uh, much of that with the children. Uh, Samuel, as you gathered, was just a youth. He was under the tutelage of Eli the high priest, and Samuel will grow up. He became one of the outstanding Old Testament heroes. His prophetic leadership was about a thousand years before Jesus. His call is described in 1 Samuel chapter 3. We'll, we'll just read the first nine verses. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel, and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And so he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and, and went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. <laughs> so Samuel did not yet know the Lord and, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and he went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. And then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. That's what Eli taught Samuel to say, to go, go back and lie down. And if he heard the voice yet again, to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Of course, that's what Samuel did. 
Next time he heard the unknown voice, Samuel listened. And then he heeded it. In fact, it was the beginning of his prophetic role. And as Susan said, he, he was then he, he became one who was trained to listen to God and to pass along that word as he was instructed. It became his very life. Prophet, the Hebrew word for prophet literally means one who tells forth the word of God, somebody who, who tells what God is asking him to tell. That became his life. What a faithful way to approach God and to approach every single day and night. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. It's a beautiful way to approach God. Beautiful way to even to pray. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amidst all the noise and all the din, the, the, the hubbub of this world, and there's a lot of cacophony out there in the world, it's to say, God, in the midst of all of this, I want to hear you. You and I are called to listen. We listen to live. We listen in order to learn. And we listen in order to love. Wayne Sinclair was working on computers at the Pentagon when a hijacked airliner smashed into the building. On that horrific September 11 morning, billowing black smoke and ash and heat just filled up the office where he and others were working. He was crawling in the moments that followed. He was crawling uh, through sharp debris on bloodied hands and knees. He was stunned, absolutely stunned by this surprise explosion. And they, they had no way to see, no way to get oriented, no clear or apparent pathway out of the stinging heat and suffocating smoke. From a distance, he heard a strong voice bellowing, if you can hear me, head toward my voice. If you can hear me, head toward my voice. Repeating over and over again, Sinclair and seven others heard that voice like it was an audio beacon. And they crawled a little bit and then they'd stop to listen again to see and make sure they're going the right direction over and over again. In fact, Sinclair explains, he kept saying that over and over and that's what guided us out of the smoke and fire. It was the voice of Isaac Ho'opi'i, a Pentagon police officer. He was one of the intrepid responders, first responders, risking everything to run into the collapsed wing of the building. Despite crumpled walls, hanging cables, the acrid smell of jet engine fuel and combustion, and, 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 and they're running in and out of the smoking mayhem to help as many as they could to safety. Six foot two, 260 pound officer in his, in his powerful build carried no fewer than eight people out on his back. And when he couldn't go any farther into the blackness and into the heat, when he couldn't go any further, he began to use his burly baritone voice. Sinclair said it was like a guardian angel calling to them. They listened. And they followed, and they lived. In the, in, the, in the dark confusion of that morning, Sinclair never actually met his Hawaiian angel. They, they didn't meet that morning. In the confusion of the darkness, once 
They were being rescued and pulled out. He, he didn't know who it was. And, and, and Sinclair spent three weeks in the hospital with second and third degree burns. And the two of them finally connected a month later. The computer programmer, and you can see he's got gloves on. He had massive, significant burns that he had to deal with. And the bulky officer who had given him hope and direction and life. And when they met, it was a tearful, jubilant hug. And they became friends for life. They both still talk about that. In the 10th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus says that he is the good shepherd who willingly lays down his life for his flock. And he says that his sheep know his voice and follow. They trust his voice and follow. And it leads to life. We listen to live. When Jesus began to tell the parable of the sower, before he begins, he says, listen. Then when he finishes the parable, he has one of his signature statements, line. It says, anyone who has ears to hear, listen. Listen. When, when Jesus went to the home of Lazarus and his sisters, Martha was famously busy in the kitchen. She was scurrying around with her hospitality tasks. You may remember she complains to the Lord, what? She complains that her sister wasn't helping. And Jesus commends Mary, who, and this is from Luke 10, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. Listen. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. It's time to listen. We listen to him because he is the way and the truth and the life. We listen because his voice leads from darkness to light. His voice, his word leads from death to life. We listen to live. And we listen to learn. Jerome Weidman was a playwright and novelist um, who tells a remarkable and true story. He called it The Night That I Met Einstein. Now, Weidman was a young, uh, uh, rising star of a writer in Manhattan. He gets invited to a swanky party at the home of a distinguished philanthropist. And after this lavish dinner, all the guests are ushered into an enormous drawing room where he notices that it's all set up for a chamber music. It's going to be a private concert. Weidman says that he has barely, he says, I'm essentially tone deaf. I have no interest in music whatsoever. But he felt trapped. He says, I couldn't get, I couldn't see any way out of this. So he sat down and he endured the first interval of music, but his mind had left the room. And when he heard applause, it startled him and he, he offered his own polite clap of appreciation. And then uh, a voice next to him asked, you are fond of Bach? And Weidman turned and he recognized one of the most famous faces in the world. <laughs> well, well, uh, well, he stumbled and realized he could not lie to Albert Einstein. I, I don't know anything about Bach. I, I never heard any of his music. He says that Einstein looked at him, perplexed, concerned. He said, he looked at me like I'd never taken a bath in my life. <laughs> And then after a brief exchange of some other question and answer, Einstein took him by the arm and said, please, please, come with me. What happened next was stunning. And by the way, you can easily find this story online if you want to read his own detailed account of it. Einstein led him out of the room, down a hallway, and upstairs to a library and music room. Apparently, Einstein knew his way around and was very at home in this place. And 
And he proceeded to give Weidman a personal music tutorial. He began by asking, well, is there any music that you like? He wanted to start where, where Weidman was. <laughs> is there any music you like? And Weidman kind of stumbled. He says, well, I like Bing Crosby. And Einstein went over to the shelf <laughs> and he pulled out an album, he brought it back over, took it out, put, took it out of the jacket and put it on the turntable and proceeded to play one of the popular songs of Bing Crosby. O only, only played it a, a, a few lines and then he picked up the needle. For those who are younger who don't know what a needle is, <laughs> it was a way that music was played when I was your age. <laughs> so he, he picked it up and he asked, he asked Weidman, well, how, what did you hear? And, and Weidman wasn't sure how to answer, so he, he, he did the best he could. He sang what he heard. He tried to sing the melody and the words. He, he, he already knew them. He just said, I did the best I could. Einstein excitedly affirmed him, oh, you see, you do have an ear. And then he proceeded to play for him a sequence of songs on the phonograph, typically allowing only a, a few lines, and then he would stop and ask Weidman what he had heard. And Einstein explained that the Crosby song was a little bit like simple addition and subtraction. And then if he would understand that and get a feel for it, he could go a little bit further to something a bit more complicated like division, multiplication, fractions. And, and so Einstein led him from some popular music to some opera selections, finally to some classical music that had no words. And he, the great man smiled and affirmed and encouraged him. And eventually, he again, put his arm around his shoulder and says, okay, young man, you're ready for Bach. And he led him back down to the drawing room and they waited until there was an, another break. And while the musicians were tuning for another selection, they walked in and sat down. And Einstein smiled again, patted him on the knee and said, he whispered, just, just allow yourself to listen. That is all. Weidman remembers. He said, that's not all. He said, oh my goodness. Without the effort he had just poured out for a, a total stranger, I would never have heard as I did that night for the first time in my life. Box sheep may safely graze. I've heard it many times since. I don't think I shall ever tire of it because I never listen to it alone. I am sitting beside a small round man with a shock of untidy white hair and eyes that contain in their extraordinary warmth all the wonder of the world. That night, for the first time, he heard the genius of Bach with the help of another genius who just assisted him to listen, really listen. The world is giving you answers each day. Learn to listen and listen to learn. This is one of the facets of North Lake that I noted early on and have really appreciated. I, I, I noticed very early that, this, that you are part of a culture that is eager to listen and learn. And I don't take that for granted. That's not true in all churches and cultures. You exhibit a, I mean, this is a church that exhibits a, 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 an eagerness. And I've told Bobby this many times. We've talked about it. This is a church that's eager to listen and to learn. And I hope never to mess that up. I don't want to screw that one up. It's a beautiful thing. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We listen to live. We listen to learn. And, and we listen to love. We listen to love. Theologian Paul Tillich said, the first duty of love is to listen. I think my wife Bobby would agree with that. <laughs>
The first duty of love is to listen. Never underestimate the importance of genuinely listening to somebody you love or aspire to love. After the first service, um, one of the men came up to me and says, are you preaching this to the husbands? <laughs> Anyone who has ears to hear, listen. <laughs> Someone once said, God gave us Mouths that close and ears that don't. That must tell us something. <laughs> when Pastor Lynn was training our new deacons, uh, she stressed the importance of listening. She used a number of uh, tools and, and instructional gems, including one that I asked her for, and, and uh, here's an excerpt of it. It's, it's beautiful. It's part of the training for our deacons. When I ask you to listen to me and you start giving me advice, you've not done what I asked. When I ask you to listen to me and you begin to tell me why I shouldn't feel that way, you are trampling on my feelings. When I ask you to listen to me and you feel you have to do something to solve my problem, you have failed me, strange as that may seem. Listen, all I ask is that you listen. Don't talk or do. Just hear me. What a beautiful gift that is. Listening intently and patiently is an act of love. Many have observed that listen and silent are composed of the same six letters. Hmm. Like Samuel, hmm. By the way, you're doing better at that than I am right now. <laughs> like Samuel, we can serve the Lord as we listen to God and listen to those who are around us. It's beautiful. One of our new deacons, Joan Kirby, um, has described her sense of calling to become a deacon. And, and in fact, it's a little bit like Samuel's in that her calling occurred when she lay down one night last summer to, to, to go to sleep and God jumped into her pathway, spoke to her. I'll just read what she has put in writing for me and for our session. She said, a member of the nominating committee spoke to me about becoming a deacon at North Lake and said that my name had been mentioned. I was very interested in hearing what would be involved and what would be asked to do. During that conversation, we talked about how much time it would take I'm involved in several worthwhile causes and didn't want to neglect my responsibilities in those organizations. We left the invitation open and I told him that I would think about it, pray about it. I kept leaning towards the thought of time. How much more time did I have for this? In bed that very night, I was praying to God. He interrupted me <laughs> by saying very loud and clear, you don't have time for me? You don't have time for me? It was spoken twice. I knew biblically that when he repeats something, it was and is very important to listen. I knew my answer. My answer was, of course I have time for you. I love people. I love encouraging people. And I love helping people. Maybe this is my best calling. We listen to love. Already I have had... Uh, a first-hand report from a woman who came into my office. What a wonderful deacon Joan Kirby has been, one of nine, but testifying to what a wonderful deacon she is. Why? She listened to that woman's disappointment. She listened to that woman's anger. She listened to that woman's grief. She listened to the voice of pain. She listened without trying to change the subject. She listened without judgment. She listened without trying to come up with her reply or to give advice. She listened as an expression of love. You and I are called to listen. We listen to live, listen to learn, and listen to love. 
Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. How about if we finish right now with a moment of silent prayer? Let's pray. Lord, we listen for your voice and we listen to your word because we love you. Amen.